I'm just thinking, having been at, uh, this is our 15th Aspen Ideas Festival. I think this is perhaps the coldest day uh, <laughs> in the history of the Aspen Ideas <laughs> Festival. So a, a special message to all of you who are watching this uh, uh, online, that if you see the panelists shivering, it's not because of fear of the implications of artificial <laughs> intelligence. Um, but I'm uh, absolutely delighted that you are braving the weather to be with us today. And again, welcome to everyone watching. Uh, the topic for this panel uh, is ethical artificial intelligence, oxymoron, uh, or is it actually a possibility for uh, tremendous uh, innovation, improvement, and actually improved equity in healthcare? Uh, essentially, our questions today relate to the fact that the algorithms used in various forms of artificial intelligence are extraordinarily powerful, but as they inherently capture historical data that reflect exclusion, privilege, bias, and the like, uh, how can they be used without perpetuating the same? Uh, will, they, will they advance equity? How can they advance equity without exacerbating it? And particularly, I think, and there have been many conversations here over the last couple of days, what are the special challenges at a time when there are so many people uh, in the world, so many sectors, that are questioning uh, fundamental trust in the scientific enterprise to start out with? Uh, to discuss these and related questions, we have a wonderful panel. Uh, you all have their biographies, so I'll be very brief. And, to allow questions also to all of you, uh, I hope uh, not too long. Uh, to my immediate left is Christopher Gibson, who's uh, co-founder and CEO of Recursion Pharmaceuticals, a clinical stage by a pharma company, leveraging the latest in automation, artificial intelligence, biology, and chemistry uh, to, discover new to discover new medicines and bring them to scale. Uh, then we have Mildred Solomon, president of the Hastings Center and a professor at Harvard Medical School where she directs the fellowship in bioethics. Millie, of course, is a bioethicist and a social scientist who, sought, who studies these very same ethical implications of emerging technologies. And finally, of course, uh, Eric Topol is executive vice president of Scripps Research, a professor of molecular medicine and founder and director of the Scripps Research Translational Institute. Uh, he previously, of course, led the Cleveland Clinic, and his new book is Deep Medicine, How Artificial Intelligence Can Make Healthcare Human Again. So let me just start with sort of this, this the, the, the notion in the title about there being an oxymoron here. Uh, you know, ethics, as we all think of it, is fundamentally an exploration of moral philosophy of a code of what is good, what is bad, which means it's inherently a pursuit rooted in the humanities. Uh, it's subjective, it's nuanced, and it's you know, fundamentally, fundamentally human. So you know, the very words artificial intelligence in their own right seem somewhat oxymoronic. Then you add the, add the word ethical to artificial and intelligence, and it almost seems like you know, oxymoronic squared. Yet artificial intelligence uh, in its various forms offers absolutely extraordinary opportunities to make healthcare more inclusive, more equitable. And as we've been discussing in many of our discussions at Ideas Health. So how can this circle really be squared? How can machine learning uh, guide, guided presumably by ethical and human principles make for more humane healthcare. So let me start, if I may, with, with Millie in, in the middle. Uh, what principles do you think should guide artificial intelligence uh, w with respect to healthcare so it can best assure trustworthiness and, and reduce the kind of bias that I talked about? Yeah, and as you said, Elliot, there, there is there are many um, similarities across a lot of these emerging technologies. None of them are all good or all bad. It's in how they're used and deployed and how much risk we're willing to take as we develop them during the research phase and what purposes we put them to. 
So to answer your question, I think the overriding principle is human welfare. Now, I might want to also say planetary welfare. We usually talk about human welfare in moral philosophy, but increasingly I think we should be talking about planetary welfare too. But today we're probably going to stick to human welfare. So that's the number one umbrella for the conversation. And that means developing applications that are going to help all of us. So there's, you know, artificial intelligence is likely to reduce costs. Um, increase profits, and for those people who develop successful applications and platforms, there's going to be a generation of enormous wealth. So we need to be sure that we're focusing on benefits to people, not just to profits. So I'd put that as number one. And then I'll leave you with three key words, and I'm happy to come back to them as we talk further. Human agency. We need to keep humans in the loop. AI has transformed the air travel industry to make it one of the safest ways to travel, but we also know that we're kind of building uh, people out, and that's created some of the problems that we've seen. Human agency. Privacy slash liberty. I'd like to come back and talk about that. And fairness, and that has multiple facets to it. So I'd put those three out first, and then I can bring some in as others join the okay, conversation. And please do jump in, and then again, we only have 15 minutes, but I want to turn to the audience uh, as well. Uh, Eric, you know, your new book declares that artificial intelligence can make healthcare human again. So, I mean, you really take this oxymoron on directly, and I love that. So explain that intentional irony and why you are so confident. Right. Well, it is an unparalleled opportunity. Uh, that is because here technology, which usually is thought to be depersonalizing, dehumanizing, it can flip. And, and that's because so much of this technology not only can make the lives of clinicians, doctors, nurses, all types of clinicians uh, much more efficient, more accurate, uh, getting rid of the data clerk functions, but the biggest thing that it can do is to give the gift of time. That gift of time is what we've lost. And so that humanity, uh, the, the bond between a doctor and patient has suffered greatly over multiple decades and it's been a steady erosion. But here we have a, a very unique chance, if we do this right, to transcend just the, the early phase of getting this accuracy and, and speed and efficiency um, and elimination of keyboards, that sort of thing. Getting more advanced, uh, efficient, drug discovery, like Chris is working on. But the bigger picture, the, the ultimate goal, would be to bring back uh, the trust, the, the, this precious, deep empathy relationship that we used to have. Well, I just let me just follow up quickly with you. Uh, uh, you know, just the very phrase, deep medicine, um, just sort of define that for us, and that sort of implies that there's something called shallow medicine, too. Yeah. So, so what yeah. are they? Well, that's good, because I, I do have a chapter in the book called Shallow Medicine. Uh, that is referring to what we have now, which is very little time, uh, very little context and presence, so that we were just talking before we started that when, a, when you go see a doctor, they're not even looking at you in that little bit of time you have. Um, and it's error-laden. And uh, we do, te tests are done just because there's not enough time. We may as well just order more tests. And so we have lots of waste in the system as well. So any way you look at it, the, the shallow medicine that we have today is unacceptable. But moreover, it's led to terrible burnout rates. So there is another hit on humanity. So clinicians across the board, it's the highest in, in the medical profession, doctors, nurses, and across the board for not just a, a burning out, but doubling of errors with that, but also depression and a very high rate of suicides. And, and we'll come back, I hope, to, to many of those things. And, and Chris, um, you know, talk to us a little bit about, about designing data for healthcare as opposed to just sort of using the data that is already there, which may be part of the answer uh, about just perpetuating bias that may be in that data. Yeah, that's exactly right. So one of the big challenges with, with machine learning and AI is that typically um, you give data scientists 
a set of data, and I guess usually it's not a stack of paper, it's electronic, but you give them some set of data, you ask them to answer a question, and at least during the last decade or so, most of the time, um, they probably don't have the right data, it's not been collected in the right way to actually answer that question really well. And so speaking from sort of the earlier side of things on, on discovery, one of the things I'm most excited about, I think a lot of people are, is trying to design data sets so that they have less bias in them, right? And so if you can actually have perfect data, which I know is just a hope and, and not actually possible, machine learning would be even much more powerful than it is today, and a lot of the bias would be absent uh, from it. So, and you know, the last point I'll make is, Everything in moderation, um, and AI has places where it's exceptionally powerful, and humans have places that they're exceptionally powerful, and we talk a lot about the bias uh, of AI, but I think it's also really important to remember how biased we are as people. Um, and so, in some ways, actually, if we can find the right yes. balance and have both of these things together in the loop, it actually feels like we could we could move move humanity forward pretty profoundly. If we are if we're integrating AI in human systems v very strategically and, and right. appropriately, I would hope that we would not only bring in more humanity, but we'd also reduce the terrible medical error rate. So you know, physicians bring cognitive biases all the time. It's not just machines that we have to worry about in terms of bias. And I think there's real opportunities here to, to get to another level of health care. Nelly, let me just stay, stay with you for a, a minute. You, you talked earlier about privacy, and there are lots of things talked about I'd like to come back to. And, and Eric mentioned issues relating to sort of depression and mental health. Let, let's just talk a little bit about these issues in the context of mental health for a, a minute. Uh, and uh, what, what are the most promising mm -hmm. aspects of artificial intelligence in your mind with respect to mental health right. uh, in particular? And also, perhaps, what are the special challenges, some of which may actually relate to privacy, uh, in the context of applications of artificial intelligence to mental health? That's a great question, and it speaks right to the oxymoron in the title of our session, because there's both very promising mental health applications and very concerning ones. So I'm going to talk about two different areas. One would be clinical interviewing. You know, we have a shortage of psychiatrists, psychologists, and mental health workers. And so there are some promising applications that are um, focused on clinical interviewing. For example, after the Iraq war, and since, for quite a long time, the Department of Defense has been trying pretty earnestly to provide mental health services to vets, and not with not that much success. And part of it is a, a lack of, of clinicians, but part of it is also cultural, um, a feeling of that it's a stigmatized thing to seek. And so they've developed an app called SimCoach. It's not meant to replace the therapist ultimately, but it's meant to address this issue of stigma and help people feel more comfortable. So it's a kind of exploratory app where you can talk to an avatar in a sense. People seem to prefer to tell their secrets and fears to a, to a non-human entity. So it has some advantages in, in that as well, and they're showing some progress. There's another application that I think is more, illustrates the more worrisome side, which is I think called Sim, um, SimSensi, and it uses sensory data to um, infer the mental state and emotional state of the user. So it, it, ha it gets voice information, body gestures, and, and, um, and face, uh, facial recognition, and makes a lot of inferences about the emotional state of the user, and, and documents them, uh, again, on the path towards a referral to a provider. But you, as the user, don't really know how you're being interpreted. And many of these affect uh, recognition uh, systems have been designed on the assumption that we can characterize our complex emotional range in terms of six emotions. I don't know about you, but I know that I sometimes feel multiple things at once, happy and sad, curious and afraid, and this system doesn't allow for any of that kind of nuance. And it infers about you without you knowing how it's labeling you. So I, it's a privacy issue in a very deep, in a very deep sense. Hmm. Uh, Eric, let me just ask you sort of directly. Is, is the, the black box problem for artificial intelligence in healthcare, you know, a deal breaker? I mean, you know, right. we're, we're all used to principles, you know, like peer review and validation of, uh, you know, by very rigorous methodology. I mean, if we don't know 
what's in the black box, how in the world are we ever going to trust it? Sure. Well, this is really a, a big controversy as we bring artificial intelligence in, into medicine. Uh, the first thing is to recognize that there are so many things today in medicine where we have no clue how it works, what we're doing. We just do it, and it's just the standard of care. Uh, and that list is long. So the question now is, are we going to hold uh, a machine to a higher standard? That is, if, we, if it's validated to the hilt, you know, prospective randomized trials, and we still don't fully understand it, how does it really work? Uh, then the question is, are we going to hold it up and not um, deploy it? until we deconstruct it and have it fully explainable. And uh, essentially, the field breaks down to two different camps. One, the computer scientists say, if it works, I'm using it. Uh, and a lot of physicians and, and medical folks say, well, we really need to understand this better. We haven't really gotten to that point, Elliot, where we've seen things fully validated, so we don't know. Um, because there's very little so far of this prospective validation. It's limited. But soon enough, over the next year or two, we'll start to see that be challenged. And we don't know exactly how it's going to be play, play out. One other thing about this is in Europe, the new standards about privacy and the um, GDPR, GDPR have said unless the uh, algorithm is explainable, we can't, it can't be used. And uh, one other thing that's really exciting in the field of AI is deconstructing the algorithms. So now so much effort is being done into this so-called ablation analysis, where basically it's, it's going backwards to find out what the features are. So there's some light here that by the time we get there with the validation, we'll also have gotten there with the ability to understand algorithms better. So have you thought about advising our Congress and development of, an, of, equivalent, of equivalent legislation in this country, or even in, in California? I mean, is there a principle like that in the California privacy there, legislation? There, there ought to be. There isn't yet. Uh, Europe is way ahead of us. And I echo Millie's concerns that we are really behind in standing up for privacy. This medical privacy is different than you know, just day-to-day -day, uh, privacy. And our data, our medical data, is at least five-fold more valuable uh, on the dark web. And it's being the cyber thievery and hacking that's going on now is, is rampant. Wow. Yeah, please, Chris, and then I'll follow up. <clears throat> on One of the things that, that comes to mind for me is this, maybe this implicit assumption that we have as humans that we can understand. And you know, I think one of the great uh, prospects of AI is the potential to generate inferences and predictions that are really useful to humanity, but that are far too complex for us to be able to actually understand. And so this is one of the things that I find challenging around this idea. To your point, Eric, you know, statins do a lot more than we thought they did when they were approved, right? This happens all the time in medicine. And yet, if you imagine the thousands of diseases today that we truly don't understand at all, we don't have treatments for, and if you study biology and medicine, basically, your conclusion typically is that we don't know very much about it as humans, right? A tiny, tiny fraction. What that, what that leads me to believe is, is that this human assumption that we must be able to understand the algorithm might be one of the things that holds us back more than anything else. Agreed. So, Chris, you, you are uh, the resident technologist on this panel, so, <laughs> or one of them, <laughs> on the business sense, on the business side. Um, so, uh, and obviously, you know, the technologists, business technologists, have lost a lot of trust recently. And uh, as someone really working at the intersection of healthcare and technology, particularly at a time where more and more people are questioning technology and its ethics, morality, its fundamental goodness. How, how do you, you know, earn and maintain trust? I mean, do you, how, do, how do you think of, of that and, and its importance in, 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 in what you do? It's a hard question. When you're trying to build a company um, that's doing something that hasn't been done, oftentimes you find yourself pretty deep and sort of siloed in the, in the sorts of problems you're working on. And I was at a conference um, in, near London uh, about six months ago, and essentially we talked about the, a whole host of people from lots of different disciplines, psychology and, and data science and 
economists, and we talked a lot about this dystopian future where AI meets biology. Um, and it was sort of a wake-up call for me in the, in the context of what we're seeing in the tech industry. And so um, it's triggered me to try and ask a lot, what could we be doing now that's actually setting us up to um, be in a tough spot down the road, to be doing things that we don't feel really good about? And I don't know the answers yet. We just have to be aware of it. That's the first part. Mm -hmm. And we have to ask ourselves constantly and hold ourselves to a high standard. Um, but the things that I know we do now, you know, there's this idea in the tech world that you move fast and break things, right? And maybe to be a little bit controversial, I actually subscribe to that in a part of our business. And that's the part of our business where we're developing algorithms around human cells that we grow in dishes, that we do experiments on in the lab, and we iteratively work uh, on, around that science. And I actually think it's really good to move fast and break things there. At the same time, we currently have two drugs that are in human clinical trials, where we're actually testing a medicine in real humans. And our approach has been as, about as conservative as it gets in terms of running those trials, because that's the one place you really don't want to move fast and break things. And so to me, I think it just comes down to being practical, to try to look to the future, to reading books by real futurists and technologists and talking to really smart people to try and think of all the ways that you, all the ways you're not thinking about. Uh, Melly, uh, who, who owns the algorithms? I mean, I mean, what what is the importance of ownership in all of in, in these yeah. discussions? I mean, is do you know do are they privately owned? Should they be privately owned? Should the government own them? Uh, you know, and how? What's the relationship between trust and 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 ownership here? Absolutely. I mean, ownership is really a, it, these applications are likely in our country anyway to be commercialized, right? And so one of the biggest issues around trust is what is the relationship between the owners of these inventions, really, and the users of them? And are we going to make, take steps to make sure that low-cost applications are marketed to low-cost, to low-paying, low um, low-income audiences? So I think they're going to be owned by both the public sector and the private sector, but increasingly, obviously, Venture capital is very, very interested um, in a wide variety of applications, e even in the use of AI in, in finding new drugs, which was an application pretty recent in terms of what you're doing, Chris, and also in terms of identifying people who are appropriate um, candidates for onc oncological clinical trials. So there's, it's, it's going to be multi-ownership, and the question is what responsibilities can I also respond to the, to the privacy concern? Yep. Uh, I think it's worth noticing that we're in a paradigm shift. We've talked about personal health information as really sacrosanct. We have the hi hi HIPAA regulations, and we have a commitment, a sense that this is ours. It's, it's mine. It's an individual thing that I should have control over. I think we're making a shift here that we might not even be aware of to seeing data, big data and artificial intelligence's use of it, as a, as a social good. And I think that's why we're in tension, because we're trying to get the community benefit from something that we've identified as a singular, a singular right. So we're figuring this out. So we don't quite know how to, how to negotiate the tension between that. And the other piece of privacy is rarely talked about in the privacy sector, but it really is another meaning of privacy, which is the right to be left alone, freedom and liberty. And one of the concerns about AI as we're, and the trustworthiness and who owns it is, is the extent to which um, this can lead to surveillance of all kinds. And then your question about who owns the algorithms is really important. But it, I think the problems can come both from the government. You know, ICE just uh, modified their algorithms to make sure that everybody spit out as 100% detainable. This has been reported by AI Now in their annual report. So in that case, the government owned the algorithm and decided to massage it to, to fit political purposes with tremendous consequences. And then we're, it, it could also be owned privately and used for marketing purposes to better understand consumer behaviors and influence our choices in ways that we're not even aware of through choice, you know, the way we frame choices for people. So it's a kind of a long answer, but I That's think good the liberty issue is really one, another side of the privacy issue. 
and we should talk about them separately. So Eric, how do you, th how do you see those issues, the issues relating to liberty, privacy, surveillance? Yes, uh, <laughs> this is complex stuff. Um, you know, just to go back first to the ownership, you know, this is software algorithms. So that's really not very expensive. What's expensive is this validation, mm -hmm. doing large, developing these large annotated data sets and then putting them through tests. And, uh, you know, startups <clears throat> just can't do that. They, this is a tech titan thing or, you know, this is, like, as Millie mentioned, uh, investors. So then the question is, you know, we, as an editor of a journal, this comes up every week now. Uh, we're going to publish your, your algorithm but we want it to be open source. Mm -hmm. And they say, no, no, we can't make it open source. You know, we put so much into this. Got to get a return. Yeah. So this is a real thorny issue that is unsettled. Um, and you don't want to, you don't want to de-incentivize the, the big efforts that it takes because what we're seeing now is a remarkable ability to take medicine, um, you know, to the hinterlands, you know, to do things that we never right. would conceive of, to level the playing field because you can have uh, algorithms and sensors and, and data that is really cheap, cheap chips, and this is really not um, holding us back from, from reducing inequities. Now, but to this point about the, the liberty and privacy, my biggest concern is that we don't own our medical data. And because we don't own it, that's why it sits on servers and it's a target for the cyber thievery uh, uh, issue. And it's not protected. So if you're gonna do artificial intelligence, and, and, and this is coming pretty quickly, where you'll have your virtual medical coach and they'll be giving you feedback as to how you can prevent this condition or better manage it. And if you don't have all your data, which nobody has mm -hmm. in this country, nobody has all their data, uh, it sits in different places and it's very incomplete. So your inputs to the uh, neural network are very incomplete and it's this garbage in, garbage out story. So we're compromised. And so that's part of the, the situation we're in now. We, we haven't asserted our rights. It should be a civil right to own and control your medical data. In Estonia, that's the way it works. Mm -hmm. And if Estonia can do it, why can't we do it? I think that's really important because if you talk to a lot of data scientists, they'll tell you, at least the ones that I've talked to, that um, algorithms themselves are pretty likely to become a commodity over the next decade or, or even less. And so the fundamental value actually lies in the data itself. And so owning an algorithm may actually not be the important part. It may be the access or ownership specifically of the data. Because 10 years from now, you'll be able to retrain the perfect algorithm on whatever data set you have in the snap of a blink of an eye. And so I think that ownership is a really, really, really important piece. T totally agree. So Millie, let, let's come back to some, some of just the practical problems of bias. I mean, you know, when, when in, in terms of big data, we, you know, the, in, and inclusiveness. I mean, in many cases, you know, the, the data significantly underrepresent women, or they underrepresent yeah. people of color, or they underrepresent people from lower socioeconomic statuses. And then there are medical, many medical conditions that we that we know relate differently, and the and the best treatments are are different depending on those kinds of characteristics. How, how, how do yeah. we deal with those problems so the, you know, so the future medicine can be more inclusive and level the playing field as, I, as, as opposed to you know, doubling down on the bias of the historical data based on who has the privilege to receive care? Right. Let's distinguish between three kinds of problems that are all fairness. They're all problems that are, arise from lack of inclusivity. There's sort of, there's bias in reflecting what we learn. So if we use a clinical, historical clinical research for the machine to learn on, we know women were excluded from clinical research for decades. NIH has corrected that. But if this is older data, it's not going to be corrected. So we get skewed knowledge. That's one form. Another form is, that what we build doesn't work for women or for other, for other people. So an example would be uh, um, there was a, a certain kinds of games. Yes, and, yeah, and in the non-health area, there's been some gaming, games that have been designed by men, and then when women took them home, they couldn't, you know, they couldn't run them. It didn't recognize their voice or their body language or something like that. Mm -hmm. and, and then the third are sort of deeper fairness issues about what's the use to which 
the application is going to be applied. So right now, for example, um, you know, I gave you the, the ICE example around migrants, but one that's more squarely in the healthcare sector is that there are decision systems that the government owns, again, back to your ownership question, that are making decisions about how many hours of care somebody with disabilities is allowed to have. And they've, they used to be assessments that were made by social workers or nurses who visited the home. They're now being made by decision systems and they are being designed to save money and therefore drastically reducing the hours of care that somebody gets at home and without recourse. So it's a human system. They could have built, maybe built those algorithms but had a human in the, in the mix. So I don't know if that's answered no, your I, question. I'm not sure there are any simple answers to it, but it's very helpful. Do you have any thoughts on, on that, Eric? Uh, or actually, let me, let me, I'm going to open it up to the audience. Who, uh, uh, many more questions, and we're going to have time to answer. But I, just thinking of your book, and you made a reference to it earlier, and another definitional question. What is deep empathy? Right. And how can we all get more of it? <laughs> <laughs> Sign up yeah. here. So, um, that's what we're missing now, which is that human human bond. So as this machine, you know, human intelligence is probably not going to change over the next century uh, to any significant extent. Let's hope some of it does. Well, yeah, maybe a little bit, but you know, to to a substantive way, it won't. But machines are just getting smarter, taking on broader tasks, and uh, what we have to do is getting more human. And what we what we have done in the medical sphere is get less because we have let these, this erosion occur. Um, so deep empathy refers to the, all the aspects of uh, that human bond, the presence, the uh, you know, listening. Typically, a uh, patient is interrupted within seconds. They never get to tell their life story or any story, actually. And uh, that's really rich, and it'll never be digitized. There's never going to be an algorithm to know what a patient's life story is all about. So to get us back to this uh, time, which, by the way, was if you go back in history uh, in the 80s and before, there was a deep relationship. The, 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 the patient doctor uh, was a precious bond, and it was trust. It was big, and it just fell apart. So deep empathy is basically getting that back. Uh, it's basically an outgrowth. Once you start to have time to spend, why did doctors and nurses and all the people that work in healthcare, why did they go into this profession in the first place? Right. And why are they so dejected now? It wasn't to fill out insurance forms, no. I don't think. No. no, and they did that, and why they're so dejected is because they can't execute their charge, what they, their mission. If we can start to restore that, then we can start to see deep empathy. Uh, we have just under 20 minutes left, so I would like to turn things to the audience. I see already lots of hands coming up. Uh, lady in the second row, and please wait for the microphone for people who will be watching this later. Hi, thank you. Um, so I represent um, part of the community that has lost a lot of trust in doctors and scientists, which is a problem because I am also a doctor and a scientist, so I don't have a high bar time reconciling like that. There's these psychiatrists in the, in the audience. Um, and I spend all of my time now with patient advocacy groups, and I represent about 40 of them, um, small rare diseases, small groups, that are literally going to revolt soon if we don't do something. I, I spend a lot of time saying, please do not bomb NIH. Please do not lay on the floor of NIH. Please do not do these crazy things that the AIDS activists did back in the day, which they hold up in value. And, if, and, and they love your second book, Eric, just so you know. <laughs> um, anyway, so I'm wondering, one of the things that I fight fiercely for is, is whoever the end user it is, and, and it's, in my case, it's the patient advocates, to have a seat in co-production, ones that are intelligent. I mean, I'm trained as a scientist and a doctor that, that understand economics as well, to do this along with you and then go back to their communities. And they also serve as a sanity filter if you're trying to do something that's just not gonna work for the patients. Have you guys tried incorporating that voice at your very just stages to help bring back deep empathy or to help solve some of the problems of how do we make this usable? I think that's a question for you. Well, you know, I, I think your point is, is really important with respect to w the medical uh, organizations are not uh, advocating for patients. They're trade guilds that are protecting the reimbursement largely or other matters for 
their doctors and specialists and whatnot. And so we have a big gap. And what any, any patient advocacy group is relatively small and doesn't have enough power to take on this. We really do need doctors to organize to get this on track. And that doesn't mean to organize for themselves, but to stand up for patients. We haven't actually seen that, doctors being activists until recent times, like when the NRA said, stay in your lane, all mm -hmm. of a sudden doctors activated. And so there is a chance now, just like you alluded to as the, uh, the, uh, in the AIDS era, when patients uh, took uh, charge, we need to see that throughout the medical profession. So that's what's lacking right now, but there's a really important opportunity, and this is something that I'm hoping that we'll see take, take hold. I just had one other point about bias and fairness about Millie brought up, and, and you did, Elliot. It, not just the human bias that is really the, the, the localizing, the, the culprit for, it's not the algorithm, they're neutral, what goes in. But the other thing is medical studies are not doing diverse uh, patient inputs. So when a, a big dermatology app that could diagnose skin cancers with 99% accuracy, it was only in white people. Mm. There were no people of color that were put into the study. And so this has to change. We've already seen this. We blew it with genomics, all European ancestry. So that's another big issue about fairness that has to be uh, brought to the uh, fore. Uh, the gentleman in the third row, and we just wait for the microphone, and then I'll go to someone over on this side. Uh, thank you all. Uh, my name's Jonathan Cohen. I direct the public health program at the Open Society Foundations. Um, there is increasing recognition, um, including in a really powerful set of case studies in the New England Journal of Medicine of the need for clinicians to be able to diagnose the social and structural determinants of health. So for example, to be able to trace respiratory symptoms to substandard housing and indoor pollution or to trace unwanted pregnancy to intimate partner violence and a thousand other examples of that. What would you see as both the opportunities and the, the limitations and risks of AI in assisting that kind of diagnosis? Millie? I think that's a wonderful place where an artificial intelligence appli application ex exists because it's getting missed. People, are, physicians are, don't have the time. It's a hurried, harried context in clinical care. I could imagine an app that would routinely ask people questions about their symptoms and be designed to know that if, if the person has asthma, to ask them questions about you know, the quality, do they, have a, do they have an air conditioner at home, and all these other questions. I think that could be designed and would be a great use of, of ensuring that, we, that this happens. But again, it would have to be built with the, with the clinical team and the machine so that we use that information and there was a protocol and a pathway for it. In terms of how it could be badly used, you know, a lot, the social determinants of health have a lot of proxy measures. Like you could, you could, you could build algorithms that um, look at smoking, let's say, but smoking isn't just smoking. Smoking is a, almost a surrogate marker these days, at least in the United States, for SES. And, and so it's, it's in a way a surrogate marker for poverty. And if we started to build algorithms that looked at social determinant variables in the wrong way, we could penalize poor people and end up charging them higher insurance premiums, for example, because they're showing higher levels of risk. So I think it's really wonderful to bring social determinants into the conversation, be less biomedical and more social. Um, but it, it's a two-edged sword like most things, and we just have to be sensitive to how we des design something like that. I don't want to succumb to sampling bias and only ask people on this side of the room. <laughs> so so in, in the third row right here. Thank you. My name is Setu Bora, and I'm with the Mashantuck at Pequot Tribal Nation. Uh, my question is, while we try to use AI to free up time and provide for more trust and empathy, why are we not asking the question about redesigning payment models and actually incentives to free up the time and unshackle the physicians and the clinicians from yeah. being tied to note bloat and EMR duties? Right, so uh, this is a problem that's specific to the United States, unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, in the UK, which I had the real privilege to work with over the last couple of years, uh, they're going after this, and they don't have any barriers like you're alluding to. 
So we, we have to do this, what you're saying. We also have a big, I have my biggest fear about the whole AI era in medicine is that the squeeze that's on right now by the administrators and the, the, the people that are overseeing the financial matters, the business, the big business of medicine, is to make things worse. Because you got all this productivity, why don't you have doctors see more patients and radiologists read more scans and on and on. Uh -huh. So to turn this around, we go back to this organized um, effort uh, of, the, of the medical community to not let that happen, to, to do what you're saying. But it, right now, the default mode is to make things worse if that's at all possible. Uh, in the back, in the orange jacket, yeah. Uh, hi, I'm a data scientist by trade. Um, and I was wondering, um, open source uh, AI technology and natural language and image processing, video processing, has sort of revolutionized a lot of things. But I've only seen that flow be one directional into medicine, not so much out of. And I'm wondering, have there been any good either open source developments in medicine that are making it to other medical communities, or is it just really balkanized, and not just balkanized, but not transferable? I'm not sure if I, I'm not sure if I understand what you're driving at. Where would it go? go? Just wait for the microphone if you would. Yeah. Uh, like, well, for radiology, for example, like you can find, have an algorithm that could find a tumor in an image that a human couldn't notice, then would that not be shared with hospital A over here because hospital A has a different radiology machine and everything else is, is oh, different? Okay. I mean, I'm, I'm saying the spread no. of AI is, is yeah, more so like... The, you're, well, you're bringing up a, a point that's already been shown in certain studies that the findings of the algorithm are venue specific. Like they work really well, not pneumonia diagnosis in this hospital, but not in that hospital. So that is another thing that has to be kept in mind. But as far as the, that's where the whole commercialization of algorithms and transferability, you know, we're, 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 it's already happening, uh, particularly in radiology in the U.S., much more in China. But no, it, there's no barriers once, the, the, the problem is how good is it really? because of this specificity, whether it's you know, the types of patients who went in or the, or the, or the hot site, the menu, that sort of thing. Uh, David. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I'm curious about the global implications of this. And um, you mentioned a little bit about sort of garbage in, garbage out data. And I'm curious for all the panelists um, thinking about the global scheme and if the data that we're getting for these algorithms is all gonna be coming from places where we capture large, large pieces of big data, Europe and North America, how do we make sure that we're inclusive of places where most of the world is, Asia and Africa? So how do, you, do we capture that data so it's inclusive? Yeah, uh, well, I, I, I'm putting forth uh, with Kai Fu Li of China a proposal, which you'll see coming out soon, that we work together to develop a planetary, this is back to Millie, planetary uh, infrastructure. Now, that's probably not likely given the current state of affairs between the China and the U.S. <laughs> but, but if you think it through, there's a, there's a thing called federated AI, which is really exciting. And what it means is you basically can tap the data locally without ever pulling it out of a country or a site or whatever. And now that's getting momentum. The, 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 this is what's so exciting about AI longer term is a planetary uh, information resource. We, the whole species learn from each other. David, to take your point uh, a few steps further, that if someone comes in ill, let's say they have cancer, that you could go through this billions of people of all types, and you could match up that person as closely as possible, so-called digital twin, and then have a, um, a treatment and outcome that you could predict Rather than from some randomized clinical trial that doesn't apply to that person, you could actually match the person with other people. And so in order to do that, you need lots of people of diverse ancestry with all their data, and that means sharing. And that means if we can't do it with China, we can't do it alone in the U.S., as you're alluding to. We, well, we do need to do that. One, and, oh, yeah, please, Millie. I was just going to jump in and say, you know, obviously trust is the, is the essential thing. We have a history of having done clinical research, traditional 
clinical research trials in the developing world in exploitative ways. That's been being corrected in some robust ways, but there's that legacy. And so not only have we been exploitative in how we've done the trials, but we've also neglected ensuring that the benefits of the research are going to go back to those populations. Kai-Fu Lee has talked about how the wealth that's going to be generated is most likely going to be in China, the United States, and Europe. And he's been starting to think about how there can be a global economic landscape in which there's benefit brought to countries that are not generating the wealth and that are actually helping to, you know, that are, that are on the losing end of that equation. And talking about what our responsibilities would be to, to make sure that the benefits are, are, are available. And I think only that way can we build that kind of trust. Thank you. In the front row. On the question of time with patients, what I've seen in Europe with National Health and uh, Britain and France, uh, at, the budget is continually collapsing because of uh, promising more than you can deliver. And as a result, the system is con congenitally broke. And so any uh, efficiency you would get from a uh, AI system, I think, would be used to reduce the number, of, to increase patient load for the existing doctors, uh, rather than give you more time for existing patients. Um, so I think it's kind of a wild goose chase. Uh, well, that's what will happen if we don't if we don't use this to turn inward and make things better. But I just want to point out how broken things are here. Mm. Uh, in case you haven't kept up with this, um, you know, we, we, ha we pay in this country $11,000 per person for health care each year. And we have the worst metrics, life expectancy three years in a row going down. The only place in the world and the only time in, in American history. We also have the worst maternal mortality, infant mortality, childhood mortality. I could go on. And the UK, which you mentioned, I also uh, touched on that, is at $4,000 a year instead of 11,000 with far superior outcomes. So and that's not the only country, of course. The whole OECD has 36 countries, 35 of them above the US uh, for all metrics. So we, this system is so bad, we, sad to say, that you can, act, you can hardly make it worse. <laughs> <laughs> Well, on that note, we have <laughs> <laughs> so good. Uh, we have time for one more question. I'm actually an optimist. <laughs> <laughs> is there a question in the corner? And this will be our last question. And then we try to end these sessions on time. Thank Aaron. you. Uh, my name is Aaron Mertz. I lead the Aspen Institute Science and Society program. I'm just wondering, when does something cease to be AI, and when does it just become a standardized technology, and how much of that frame of AI elicits fear and these kinds of discussions appropriately and possibly even unnecessarily? Chris. Yeah, one of the things that <clears throat> I think is, is actually quite interesting is that if you put a lot of pretty believable people in a room, data scientists, software engineers, et cetera, and you ask them to define AI, you actually will often see a lot of arguments. Um, so it's, it's itself a pretty nebulous term, and in many ways it's sort of become marketing. And I think as we start to get used to seeing it in society, as we realize that AI is being deployed, and it is in, in many settings, um, it's being deployed all the time when you're clicking around on websites and optimizing ads for you. And, and so I think it will become normalized just like every other technology over, over uh, you know, a decade or so. I think you had a... No, that's fine. Yeah. Well, it's appropriate to say that the sun is coming out again. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so, Very good. So Optimism. let me thank these three wonderful panelists. <laughs>